What is it you wanted to talk to me about? Well, it's not necessarily wanting to talk to you about, but it's something to talk about. Good. Um, it's very committal okay. of you. We watch movies together, right? We're regular movie buddies. I don't react as large to movies as I do here. <laughs> Whoa! Oh! Bonito! Big reactions. Big reactions. Do you think talking and mocking the movies actually heighten our reactions to the movies? Being observed. Yeah. heightens them. Science will tell you when you observe a reaction, it changes that reaction. And so just the fact that there's a camera pointed at us and inevitably in the future, an audience watching us, that changes our persona. It basically all goes back to Heisenberg. Heisenberg? That was a big... I reacted a little too much. Uh... I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Before I tell you tonight's movie, something's been bothering me. Uh-oh. And I can't get it off my mind. You remember a few months back when we did our run of auteurs? Yes. That was a good time, Yeah, right? that was a good remember time. We picked the names out of the hat and yep. we saw some great movies. Mm-hmm. But you said you wanted to watch a movie by a certain director, and we didn't do that. And it's it's been eating away at me, Craig. I can't sleep at night. <laughs> really? It could have something to do with the neighbors, but I'm not <laughs> sure. I feel like tonight I need to make things right, and we need to watch a movie from the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. This isn't one of those bait-and-switch things that, that you do. <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it isn't. <laughs> Mr. Hitchcock would approve. Hitch, if I may be so bold, and Bogdanovician, has made a whole lifeboat load of classic films, some of which are considered to be the greatest films of all time, and most of which I have seen. But I haven't seen this one. This film combines suspense, sinister plotting, and outmoded communications methods. If it were remade today, it might be called Tweet Hashtag Murder for Murder, but you and I know it as... Dial M for murder. I have also never seen this one. What? Uh, no, I, I never have. It always looked like the, the hokey Hitchcock movie. Released in 1954, starring Grace Kelly and our favorite man pursued by bats, Ray Milland. <laughs> DMFM was based on a popular stage play by Frederick Knott. This film was made during the 3D movie craze of the early 1950s, and it was shot with M.L. Gunsberg's Natural Vision 3D camera rig. Shortly after the film was released, America lost interest in 3D films. Until recently, of course. And we will never lose interest in it again. I swear. Said Hitchcock of the fad, It's a nine-day wonder, and I came in on the ninth day. And as we all know, this director likes to make little cameo appearances in his movies. I don't know where he comes in in this one, but let's keep our eyes peeled and see if we can spot him. Like a rare tubby bird. If only I knew what he looked like. You may not know this, but tonight's film concerns murder. Really? Oh, yeah. So I thought your gift should be suitably macabre. Enjoy. If you dare. Uh. <laughs> It's what? got a little hook so you can wear it as an accessory. Oh, look down, down here. You could wear it up top like a bolo tie. Yeah, I, I could wear it as a belt buckle. Good evening. Won't you come over with us to the old leather couch to hear a story about murder in Dial M for Murder? Dial M for Murder. <laughs> The sexy new film from Alfred Bitchcock. <laughs> Dial M for murder starts with some kissing. And that's how you kiss. <laughs> uh, darling, you haven't seen a bat r lately, have you? <laughs> <laughs> but then she sees in the paper that a boat's arrived from America. And who should be on it but Mark, her old lover from a year ago. Soon enough, she's kissing Mark. But Margot is married to Tony Wendis. She's having an affair, and she's been receiving blackmail letters. Tony comes home, and the three of them have a friendly chat like old friends. What are you doing tomorrow night? Saturday? Uh, nothing I know of. Well, how'd you like to come to a stag party? Tony has some work to do. Why don't you two kids go out, and I'll stay here at home, he says. Well, could you join us after the theater? We might go somewhere. Why don't you give me a ring and in intermission? Dial M for me. 
<laughs> but Tony seems to know that something is up. He's plotting for some murder. M, 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 <laughs> M. Tony calls a man who he's going to buy a used car from. He tells the man to come over to the house so they can close the deal. C.A. Swan arrives, and Tony starts telling him about his marital troubles. His wife is cheating on him and such, and he's considering murdering her. And I think I know you from somewhere. We went to Cambridge together, and I've been following you for the last year. What? Here's a picture of us at a reunion, and a very fat, bold fellow. Ah, ah, what? There is... Tony reveals to Swan that he's been blackmailing his own wife. Cold. That's some cold stuff that, to do that, man. Swan is like, why are you telling me all this stuff? And Tony starts to reveal that he knows a few dirty little secrets of... Secrets. Dirty little secrets about Mr. Swan's shady past. He's gonna blackmail him into murdering his wife for him. And Tony offers to pay Swan a thousand pounds for his troubles. So Swan agrees to kill Margot. And Tony starts to unfold the plot. He tells Swan that he's going to leave a key under the carpet. He should come in, kill the wife, steal a few things, and get out. And here's the most important thing. Don't forget to put the key back. Under the stair carpet. Yes. Swan is very calm about all this. <laughs> I would be losing my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could possibly go wrong in all that. Tony and Mark get ready for their night out. Darling, when are you going to finish pasting in those clippings? Oh, I should find time one of these days. No, you won't. This is the uh, Excuse me. Did not mean to say that out loud. Where they'll leave Margot alone in the apartment so she can get murdered. And he and Mark leave for their party. It's almost 11 o'clock. Who should show up but Swan? I'm frightened, Craig. Hold me. Not in my head. But the phone doesn't ring. Turns out that Tony's watch has stopped. Just as Swan is about to abandon the project because Tony never called, the phone rings. Margot comes out. She answers the phone. Hello? 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 She says hello, hello, like 15 times, you know, to build attention. Hello? Tony doesn't say anything. Hello? And Swan makes his move. She struggles around the desk. She finds a convenient pair of scissors. Come on, do it! And she stabs Swan in the back. He falls down and dies. <laughs> Double your pleasure and Double your pain. Margot is alive. Oh, no, where was I? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hello? She picks up the phone to call the police. But Tony's on the other line. Margot? And she says, Bad things. I just killed a guy who was trying to kill me. Did he get away? In a sense. <laughs> he got away from this earth. I'm coming home, but don't call the police. Darling, what was that about? <laughs> he tries to calm down Margot, and meanwhile he starts moving things around in the room to remove the evidence of himself from the plot. Oh, police... There's been a ghastly accident. Yes, sir. A man has been killed. The police arrive and investigate. The next day, Inspector Hubbard arrives. Good morning, madam. I'm very English. He starts to question Margot about what happened. Uh, just show me exactly where you were standing. And put on the outfit you were wearing when it <laughs> happened. Slowly. Slowly. He starts to find some inconsistencies in her story. He also knows that there was a blackmail note inside Swan's coat, which Tony planted there, so he thinks that she's hiding the fact that she murdered Swan. You invited him here to kill him. You dialed him up and just dialed M. How do you think I got these bruises on my throat? You could have caused those bruises yourself. People do. And Margot is put on trial for murder. Guilty. And she is sentenced to death. Tony is very happy with himself. His plan backfired, but ended up not backfiring because now his wife's going to die anyway. And he just has to wait for his wife to die so he can collect the inheritance. But Mark Halliday, the mystery writer and smart guy, starts to put the pieces together. He comes to Tony. Hi. Oh, hi, Mark. He totally explains exactly how Tony originally wanted the murder to happen. If he copped to this, the wife would get off and Tony would only go to prison for a few years. Why should I want anyone to kill Margot? We both love her. 
I love a strong word. I was fond of her at, at the most. I'm not a Spaniard. <laughs> Hubbard shows up. And he says, you know what, I've been thinking about things. And he rattles on about some stuff. Well, my sergeant happened to be making inquiries at Wales's garage the other day. And he said... <laughs> The inspector asks Tony if he's missing a blue attaché case. Tony says, yes, I am. But Mark in the bedroom sees a blue attaché case there. It's full of money. His whole plot that he had thought he had made up was actually the real murder plot that was supposed to happen. Inspector, before you go... Presents the case to Inspector Halliday, Inspector Hubbard, and he says, he really did it. He did it. He tried to kill Margot. Before you came, Inspector, he was trying to persuade me to go to the police with the most fantastic story you ever heard. The one about Jesus. <laughs> oh no, that's the greatest story you've ever heard. <laughs> Perhaps you'll change your will. You'll have done it all for nothing, Tony. I'm so caught up in this plot that I've forgotten to make jokes about bats. <laughs> Margo, she's supposed to be in jail. She shows up, she can't get into the house because her key from her handbag isn't working. Hubbard lets her in and he says, well, that wasn't your key. I have your key. The key that I'd taken from your handbag didn't fit the lock. And if it does not fit, then you must acquit. And the key Wendis took out of Swan's pocket and returned to her handbag was Swan's own latch key. And there's another key out there somewhere and only I know where it is, is underneath the carpet and the stairwell. Tony He's gonna come back here. I stole Tony's key. He won't be able to get in. He'll look for the key under the carpet. He'll use that one. And that one will be proof because he left the key there for the original murder. A yoink. Double yoink. Triple yoink. <laughs> well, the jig is up. I might as well have a drink before I am executed for murder. This is the polite British equivalent of adjusting my large penis. <laughs> that was dial M for murder. Somebody picked up and somebody was put down. As we know, it's difficult for a play to make a transition to a movie. Yes. A lot of times it just plays like a play on camera. Mm -hmm. Now, how did this movie transcend that or did it transcend that? I don't think it did. I, I, I don't know if I've seen a movie more theatrical in my entire life. And I'm comparing this to Rope and Lifeboat, two other Hitchcock movies, which all take place on one set. Both those movies, he constantly makes it exciting that we're only in one place for the entire time. This time, it was just annoying. It's like, you have a garden. Go out to the garden for a scene. Why don't you go down to the station? To me, it was hard to enjoy the movie because I felt so confined within the, the three walls of the set. I, I think I disagree with you on this because I think this movie in particular shows Hitchcock's knack of truly drawing the audience into what's going on through his use of the moving camera, the mm -hmm. way the camera floats around, the way the camera picks up what the characters are looking at. I know this is all basic filmmaking, yeah. but Hitchcock does it so well that I really felt like I wasn't just watching a play. I didn't think that Hitchcock was doing enough, and when he would do something interesting, it would draw so much attention to itself. When he shoots from where you see, like, over the bottles, was that just a way of making the 3D pop more? Or was he trying to make it seem as though we're voyeurs on the situation, but it was just drawing attention to the fact that we were trapped in this room? Okay, well, what's the solution then? The solution is to go to more locations? Go to more locations. They went to a stag party, for God's sake. There was, yes. He could have had some parts of conversations elsewhere. That's, that's all you have to do. Has there ever really been a play that's been adapted for the screen that everyone's agreed is great? I mean, everyone seems to either say, well, they didn't do enough with it or they did too much with it. No. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? People say, oh, they shouldn't have gone out to the bar. They shouldn't have left the house. But if they didn't leave the house, they'd say like, oh, well, they were just in the house for this whole time. Yeah. This is, isn't this supposed to be a movie? Why don't you go out to the garden? I, I know the playwright, Edward Elby, didn't like that. He's wrong. And anyone who says that is wrong because it just makes the movie a little bit more interesting. Glengarry Glenn Ross, you know, that doesn't feel like you're confined to the space. Hitchcock 
forgets how to show not tell and that's something that he's really really good at at the beginning he has it this is our couple she looks at the paper ah she realizes the boat's coming in we show we see the boats coming in now she's kissing someone else he doesn't tell us anything other than with the visuals but late in the movie Hubbard is narrating everything that's going on outside the window. He's going around to the back entrance. He stopped again. He's looking at the handbag. You don't need to tell us this. We're not on stage. Hitchcock should have figured out more visual ways to tell the story. It's mainly a story of talking and a story mm. of words. And so you have to just do service to the words as best as you can while trying to make it visually interesting. Yeah. Well, you, you can only do so much. I don't know if you noticed it. There was a close-up of a finger turning the rotary on the phone. Mm -hmm. The 3D cameras that they used could not get extreme close-ups. And so he created a giant phone and, then and a giant shot. finger to come in and turn the thing. Well, that's impressive. You can't do that on stage. You cannot do that on stage. Some people have problems with black and white movies. I don't like early color films. Everything looks fake. For me, I have kind of a fondness for that look, just because I remember seeing those movies when I was a kid on television. Yeah. And, and that's just nostalgia for me. It's kind of like a negative nostalgia. Just gives me this feeling of dread, like thinking about your parents fighting. How you, you, you just have like some, shake I, on the inside. I think you have some unresolved psychological things going on here. Yes. I, you, maybe you need to speak there, to someone. There, there was a time my parents argued while I was watching John Huston's Moby Dick, and I just never <laughs> got over it. All right, final thoughts on Dial M for Murder. You didn't like it. I'm, but I'm happy I saw it. I like the visuals. I like the Hitchcockiness, and it was good. To me, it was okay. You know how I think I would have liked it better? If I was closer to the screen. I'm sorry, my basement is so huge. It's huge. So for you, this movie might have been called Dial M for Mediocre. Well, for you, Dial M for Marvelous. Well, we hope you thought this experience was marvelous and not mediocre. And you should check out Dial M for Murder if you haven't seen it. And if you haven't seen our website, you should go check that out too. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. There are so many things to do there. Uh, not murder. You can't murder there. But you can watch our show and you can go to the PayPal donation button and you can make a donation to support this show. We've had so many generous viewers uh, donate to our show and here are the latest of them. Brian, who says, even though you didn't pick one of my suggestions for the 50th episode, I still love this show. Thank you, Brian. I can't pick every suggestion, but we do our best. Wade, who says, I always feel that Craig is a younger version of Steve Buscemi. Don't believe it, Wade. Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> I, <okay>. Wow. <laughs> Laura, Arwen, Andrew, Edil who says, I've been moving a lot and haven't found many people to talk about movies and dissect them. Since you guys began doing the show, I've been hooked. You guys remind me a lot of me and my friends, Sydney and Andrew. All right. Hey. Ronald, who says, watched all these seasons this past Memorial Day weekend. Man, my wife was pissed. <laughs> Jay, Corey, and Bob, who says, I'm a PhD student with no time to watch movies, but I feel like I can vicariously watch the classics and know something about them and others with your commentary. Thank you all for your donations. Uh, it's such a pleasure to know that you, out of the goodness of your heart, decide to support this show. That's great. And now, old boy, it's time for Seen It. Seen It. Tony Mayer writes, Cannonball Run, Hal Needham deserves some auteur love. Seen It. Seen It. This movie, when I was a kid, it blew me away i loved it and the best part about it was during the credits they played all the bloopers yeah. and the goof em ups and you just get to hear burt reynolds laugh and that is the greatest sound in the world and i thought why don't why doesn't every movie do this yeah i watched cannonball run recently it's terrible <laughs> it's so bad of course it's terrible <laughs> i remembered it being so funny you should never trust your seven-year-old self i think it was because i didn't get most of the jokes so i imagine that they were probably funny but then when I grew up, I realized they weren't funny. Yeah. Brian Hines writes, I'd like to see North by Northwest. I just watched it and it immediately jumped onto my top 10 movies list. That, I have seen it. Seen it. It has fashion. It has great dialogue. It has exotic locations. It's comedy. I always thought that movie was just like thriller, 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 mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of levels. Thank you, Brian. I might have to go back and watch this sometime soon. Yeah. Hitchcock Marathon. Do it tonight. 
Hitchcock double feature. Cleo Z writes, I would really love for you to watch After Hours. It is my all-time favorite comedy of all time. Seen it. Seen it. Craig, you talked about this movie at length on our buddy Rob Matsushita's 10 Minutes About Your Favorite Movie podcast. Yes, I, I know did. you had a lot to say about it, but maybe you can take some of the choice bits from there and encapsulate them into a small capsule here. It was the first time that Scorsese did a comedy, and it, it makes me wish he did a dozen of them. I'm going to sound really pretentious here. It's, it's Fellini-esque in mm-hmm. that it takes what it's like to live in New York at that time and turns it into this weird, surreal fantasy. Yeah. Do you like After Hours? I thought yeah. the ending was really dumb. The ending? Where he's like, he turns into a statue or something. <laughs> Watch it again. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I Like House, True Story writes, Shortcuts, another Altman classic. Seen it. Seen it. I love this movie, and I love the writing of Raymond Carver. And just the fact that Altman could take these Raymond Carver short stories, translate them to film, but also weave them together. Where does the movie begin and where does the movie end? Is it just one... It, it's a mosaic if there's ever been a mosaic put on film. The other movie that seems to be based off of shortcuts is our least favorite, Crash. Oh, yeah. 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 If you like Crash, don't watch Shortcuts because you have horrible taste. Uh, <laughs> Ouch. I'm sorry. That was very snobbish, but I'm right. Gerard Hazelwood writes, A Mighty Wind. Seen it. Seen it. Now, you and I have differing opinions about this movie, because I think you like this movie quite a bit. This is my favorite Christopher Guest movie. I was not crazy about it. Huh. I think all the Mickey and Minnie... Mickey and Mallory. Mi- Mallory? No, that's Natural Born Killers. Oh. Mickey and M- Minnie. I don't no, know. No, that's Disney. Right. All of that stuff is great. Yes. That whole plot. Mm-hmm. If the movie was, like, 40 minutes long and it was just them, I would have loved it. Uh, all of the other comedy, it was just too broad, and it was too, like, this would never happen. A lot of the uh, comedy broke rather than bent. And so, that is Seen It. And that's our show. Thanks for watching Dial M for Murder. Put down that phone. Don't you dial M for murder. Don't do it. And put down those scissors. Don't murder someone on your own. Unless they're trying to murder you, in which case, stab them with the scissors. That's, that that's okay. Stop, stop Wait. <laughs> Good night. Wait. What? Don't you say good night because we've got unfinished business. Do we? Don't you realize what next month is? Next month is July. Sci-fi. That's right. Next month we're going to be watching sci-fi movies here on the show. Now we're not going to do it quite like we did last time. I don't have a smorgasbord of movies for you to choose from. I'm sorry to say that. But you do get to make choices. And those choices will determine what movies we watch. You have three choices. You can choose good, bad, or worst. If you choose good for the first movie of Sci-Fi July, I will show you a good movie. I can't guarantee you're going to like it. I can't even vouch for its goodness because I've never seen it. But I can guarantee that it has at least an 80% freshness rating on RottenTomatoes.com. For the second movie of Sci-Fi July, I will show you another good movie. If you choose bad, I will show you a bad movie. Not terrible. Probably 40-50% fresh. For the second movie of Sci-Fi July, you and I will flip a coin. If I win the coin toss, I will show you any sci-fi movie I want. If you win the coin toss, then you get to pick the movie. If you choose worst, I will show you a really bad movie. This movie has a 0% freshness rating on RottenTomatoes.com. This is bad. It's gonna hurt. But for the second movie, you will get to choose the sci-fi movie of your choice. Guaranteed. So have you made a decision? I'm going to choose the worst sci-fi movie you can find. Believe me, I found it. (laughs) And we're going to be watching it next time here on Welcome to the Basement. We'll see you then. Why won't this latch key work? (laughs) Oh, what do I do now? (laughs) Perhaps there's one in the secret place. (gasps) Oh, here it is. Under the stair carpet. A man has been killed.